I want to again thank our witnesses today. It was uh, it's very interesting to uh, to hear their thoughts, and the chairman and I are are uh, of one when it comes to this kind of thing. Um, when we talk about uh, um, acts of genocide or or crimes against humanity, or decide what we call it, um, why would the U.S. State Department be reluctant, based on all the available evidence, to upgrade its current designation of ethnic cleansing to at least crimes against humanity, if not genocide. Anyone have a thought on that? I, I don't speak for the State Department. I don't know what they, maybe they haven't, uh, maybe uh, they haven't seen it. I don't, I, don't, I don't know why the State Department doesn't. Maybe there's a legal distinction, but um, uh, I, have, I don't speak for the State Department. So neither do I anymore. Um, but uh, I would say on uh, this issue, um, let me not speculate about motivation, but let me just say the findings that were released in the port make a pretty much a facial case for crimes against humanity. It doesn't use the term crimes against humanity, but all of the sort of legal predicates are sort of spelled out in language that frankly does have legal weight. They speak about indiscriminate killing, they speak about widespread and large scale violence, and they speak about premeditation. All of those are the key elements of a crimes against humanity finding. And I don't know why they wouldn't take the extra step there. In the past, uh, past administrations have struggled with issues around legal characterizations, either because they really had trouble uh, sort of making the legal case to themselves internally or because they were concerned that announcing uh, a legal conclusion uh, might put a burden on them to take policy actions that they weren't prepared to take. Um, I fear in this context it might be the latter, at least as concerns crimes against humanity, because it seems like such a straightforward determination and it really seems, based on the way in which the report is written, that they've arrived at that conclusion and just re been reluctant to articulate it. Thank you. Uh, the uh, civilian government of Burma seems to be focused on economic development in northern Rakhine State as the way <coughs> to encourage Rohingya to come home, notwithstanding the desperate economic conditions there, these efforts seem devoid of an acknowledgement of the systematic denial of basic human rights, which Rohingya in northern Rakhine State have endured for decades. So given the challenges of Rakhine State and the mixed results of peace building and transitional justice initiatives following mass atrocities in other parts of the world, what would potential transitional justice mechanisms look like for Burma? What kind of initiatives should we be supporting as part of a broader policy toward Burma? Well, first of all, um, inviting them back, they've got a problem is that, number one, they're non-citizens, they're not people under the, under the Constitution. Secondly, is that for a while they're saying they'd have to have some identification cards to come back, but it's not like they walked out with, their pa with a passport and a driver's license. I mean, their homes were burned to the ground and everything they had, they left you know, with a shirt on their backs if they had a shirt on their backs, and oftentimes not with their children if their children had you know, been murdered or wandered off. So it's a little unrealistic to think that this is some sort of economic development. I think sort of as, uh, even before we get to that, there has to be some recognition that these are people and we're not, even, we're not even there. And I think the condemnation as genocide is helpful. Uh, obviously, um, sanctions, as has been suggested, has in, in historically been somewhat helpful, but I think that we're so far off from thinking that they're going back anytime soon. So I, I agree with that. Um, I think in order to have a transitional justice mechanism to begin thinking seriously about him, you need to have a real transition. And this is, at best right now, a stalled transition. Um, you, know, you have a situation where uh, there really isn't uh, meaningful access to many areas of Northern Rakhine State by humanitarian act actors, which is controlled, that access is controlled by the Tatmadaw. You don't have a recognition of, of the catastrophe that's happened uh, on the part of either the civilian or the military leadership. Um, you don't even have a civilian leadership that's willing to call uh, this people by its name. Um, without these kinds of predicates, thinking about a transitional justice mechanism, which is the kind of mechanism you would put in place when you had a sort of consensus, a political consensus in a country that there was a time to, it was time to take a step forward to a new political moment, we're not there yet. There's too much that needs to be done. Thank you. Let me, let me ask one final question. Some of our colleagues in the Senate would argue that disciplinary measures against Burma's military might make it harder to transition to democracy and end the, the Civil War. 
Um, however, the UN fact-finding mission report found that these same military leaders are one of the greatest barriers to democratic reform. So given the political entrenchment of the Burmese military and the constitutional weakness of the civilian government, what can be done by the United States or the international community to encourage the military to get out of politics? Uh, well, first of all, we thought that lifting the sanctions in about 2012, some of the sanctions would somehow coerce them. It was a recognition of moving towards a democracy. That obviously didn't work. Um, in, and again, I'm speaking as myself, as a, you know, we can't police the world, and I don't think we can police the world, but we don't have to participate. We don't have to let people participate in the world like the military leaders who are behind this. So I don't know how, to, how, you, how you get the military to sort of back off. You know, we've, we've, tried, we've tried many things over, over many decades, but I think letting them participate in the world and not the United States not taking a stronger stand um, makes it, makes it is probably, I think we should take a stronger stand. Um, now, the, the, the reference to the um, a criminal uh, international tribunal, the International Criminal Court, um, if, if that worked, I'd be all for it. But the International Criminal Court has been somewhat feckless historically. The, the Sudan has had an, an outstanding genocide indictment against President Bashir of Sudan um, for, I don't know, what's five, six, seven, eight years, and nothing has been done. So I don't think we can think of the ICC as some you know, answer to all this. I think it really is incumbent upon the United States and Congress to make a decision about what it wants to do, what kind of statement it wants to make. Um, but I think, I think what's been most successful and not particularly successful is when the United States takes a strong stand and doesn't participate with nations that are doing ethnic cleansing or genocide. So I will I'll just um, yeah. a couple of thoughts about this. Um, I, I think the challenges that all international uh, criminal justice mechanisms face is they don't have enforcement powers of their own. They really re need to rely on member states uh, to enforce their warrants and their and their judgments. Um, so if the international community gets behind an, an accountability effort, uh, which I think is certainly warranted in this case, it's also going to be important to do the diplomacy that's necessary to, to mobilize the international community to deliver on judgments that are reached and warrants that are issued. Um, in terms of the question, you know, how to bring the military uh, along on this case, I mean, I, I, I tend to agree there's not a magic bullet. Um, I think the impulse is going to have to be uh, sort of uh, driven from internally by a reform uh, effort that frankly just is not evident right now. That that group or that basis of reformers um, has not, I think, yet materialized. I think one hopes that the kinds of pressure tools that we've talked about, targeted sanctions, threats of accountability and the like, um, can help demonstrate that this is not a satisfactory status quo for anybody involved. And then I think the other you know, piece of this is continued engagement and a conversation with the civilian leadership and frankly conversations with the military leadership as well to, to make the point that um, if, if Myanmar wants to progress, if it wants to diversify uh, you know, its ability to engage diplomatically, militarily um, with a full range of international actors, then it's ne gonna need to evolve beyond uh, the, the sort of straitjacket that it's placed itself in at this point. Thank you. Thank yeah, you, thank you. And, very I, much. and I think Beijing's pressure at the Security Council uh, has been a, a, a very real impediment to trying to move the international community on this, given their veto. Uh, we go to Eliana Ross-Layton in Florida. Thank you so much, Chairman Royce.